Welcome to the Startup of the Year podcast, where each episode we showcase exciting new companies from around the world. This podcast is produced by Established, creators of the Startup of the Year program. Established is focused on helping organizations with their innovation, startup, and communication strategies. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Start of the Year podcast. I'm Frank Gruber, co-founder and co-CEO of Established, co-founder of Established Ventures, and the team behind the Startup of the Year community and this very podcast. Thanks for being here. In this episode, you're going to hear a conversation between Nick Outman, uh, he's from the law firm Hill Ward Henderson, and Lauren Coffey from Tampa Bay Inno and Tampa Bay Business Journal. The two are going to talk about finding and uh, setting up your startup for success from a legal perspective. The conversation took place at our ninth annual Start Your Summit, which happened in January back in Tampa. Uh, a lot of fun, a lot of good things happened at that event, and this is one of them. So if you're a startup founder that's just getting started, you're going to need this information. If you've started companies before, still might find some helpful tips and, and tricks here as you run uh, your company, so definitely listen up. Uh, Before we jump in, though, we've got a spotlight for one of our startups from the Startup of the Year community. The startup we're going to be focusing on today is Integrate School, which is a a company that allows teachers to reduce the number of platforms needed to run their classroom and efficiently create and manage lesson plans. Integrate's platform enables K-12 through schools to streamline their classroom workflow by offering a suite of cohesive and automatic learning management tools. So if you want to learn more about this company, uh, this early stage startup, go to www.integrateschool.com. Again, it's www.integrateschool.com to learn more. All right. Now let's jump in with a conversation with Nick Outman and Lauren Coffey. Um, I'm Lauren Coffey, speaking of, um, and I'm here to talk to Nick today about funding and startups and all the fun things. So thanks for coming out to us and Everyone online, hello. Um, you want to dive right in? Sure. Yeah, let's go. I know we have a short amount of time. So just tell us who you are, what your experience is with startups and funding, and kind of why you wanted to get involved in this fun little world. Yeah, so I'm an, I'm an attorney. I'm a shareholder at Hillward Henderson here in Tampa. Um, our firm is about 115 lawyers here in Tampa. I'm in the corporate group, and my I focus on really helping startups, investors, and founders who are you know working on growth-oriented companies um, and I, you know, we're with a full complement of team uh, of, of you know, subject matter experts at our firm. Um, but my focus is really on capital raising, corporate governance, and and kind of general corporate work for startups and, and advising investors as well. Okay, so we're just going to go through kind of what happens when you try to get funding. So let's say you're a startup founder and you're just thinking about it. What's the first step they should take to make sure they don't get in trouble later on? Yeah. So, I mean, first step is really is similar things you're going to do whenever you're starting any business, right? So you, you're going to want to set up your company, do all the normal kind of corporate building blocks types of things, make sure that your business is protected, you're protected. Um, you know, at the outset, it's not, it's not really, uh, uh, you know, it, you're prepping for fundraising the moment you start the company. But that being said, I, mean, I think we'll talk about this some later on too, but you know, the there are certain things you may want to do if you're on that track. You know you're setting up your company to go out quickly, raise capital. Uh, you know, this, the startup world is, to a large extent, especially in an early stage, kind of commodified or commoditized, you know, where, where investors look for, you know, certain or prefer to invest in a certain sort of structure. They expect to see certain things. And so ha- understanding those things up front and having them in place can help, can help you know, s- smooth the process. Okay. So they do that, and now they're going to meet with VCs. What is the next step they should take? Or what are some things they should look for? Yeah, I mean, I think when you talk about, you know, those first meetings with VCs, and I think from, from, a, from a business perspective, this is probably going to be talked about by another panel, I think, today. Um, but, you know, from, from, the, from the legal point of view, you know, there's, there's an interrelationship there with what, what kind of terms they're looking for, what, what's the structure your investment going to be, so as you go to as you go to meet with investors, you know, and a lot of this is stage dependent, obviously. But when you go to meet with investors, you know, having an idea of of what sort of the the playbook is looking like for you from a capital raising perspective going forward, you know, not just at that first step, but you know, being able to say in those initial conversations, yeah, you know, our our plan is we're going to raise you know five hundred thousand million dollars in a in a safe or a note, and then we're going to you know that's going to get us to 
you know, prove out the product, be delivering it, be, have you know, kind of verifiable recurring revenue numbers. And then we're going to, and then we're going to do a, you know, seed round or an A round in 12 months or 18 months or whatever it might be. And, and being able to just understand what you're talking about at a high level on those things and having an idea of what that's going to be, that's what's going to come up in those, in those early conversations. I think in the, in the second order, third order type of conversations, it, when you, you start to get a little more in the weeds, potentially, you know, at least having an, uh, uh, being conversant with the terms associated with the different types uh, of investments that an investor might want to make or that you might want to have the investor make. And so that would be, you know, kind of understanding what it means to have, you know, participating preferred, you know, what, what it means, what, what, how does a safe work? How does it, has a no actually work in terms of the conversion terms? You know, those types of things that um, you want to have at least a reasonable understanding of, be able to talk to them about and understand what they look for, you know? So, you know, if it's a, and, and again, this is not something you're going to talk about in initial conversations, but, but as you get a little bit further down the road, you know, you know, being able to, being able to understand, you know, okay, what do you guys normally look for? What, you know, how do you structure, you know, your preferred stock rounds? What, you know, what do you normally look for on that? Is it a participating preferred? Is it straight preferred? You know, are you, are, are you know, the understanding what those things mean? Um, because that, that has a real, those are real significant top line kind of economic points that you might be focused on talking about valuation, but when, when you settle on a valuation number and the investor comes back later and says, well, we all, you know, you're going to have a 20% free money option pool. Do you know what that means? You know that that's really, you're, you know, you're basically repricing the deal at that point. Um, so, so having a good understanding of that, having advisors that you can talk to about those things and, and, and not get blindsided when you ultimately see everything laid out in a, in a cap table or, or in a, you know, waterfall model and realize that your economics are not really what you thought they were going to be. Do your homework basically right. <laughs> beforehand. Right. Touching this a little bit, but on the flip side with the VCs, what is something that they may get scared of when they see the founder come in or that would be a bonus for them? I'm like, oh, we really need to work with them. Yeah, I mean, from a, from a legal perspective, they're probably not going to look at your company and say, wow, they did a great job on their legal formalities. I definitely want to invest in this company. Uh, but, but, you know, they're, like I said before, you know, there's, they're going to look for, they want things to be checked the box, right? Because they're focused on the business, the economics. And so they say, look, we talk about an institutional investor, you know, an institutional venture capital fund almost every time they're going to prefer you to be in a Delaware C Corp. They're going to hope you have in place, you know, uh, the basic building blocks of, you know, employee agreements and, and your intellectual properties squared away. They don't want to spend a lot of time bogged down in, in cleanup matters. And they don't want you to be spending that time in, in the legal spend associated with that, you know, an initial equity raise and you spend six figures in legal fees doing cleanup work. That's, that's not in anybody's interest. But most of that's not going to scare them away. You know, it, most of that stuff can get fixed or changed. And, and usually there's not a significant cost to doing so. The things that are really scary are major capitalization issues. Um, so, you know, you've gone out and raised a bunch of money over a few years and a bunch of different notes with different terms. Or maybe you have a cap table that already has from friends and family and early investors, 50 or 60 people on it. Uh, maybe you have securities issues associated with how you raise money, um, you know, that you have a whole bunch of, you know, non-accredited investors and things like that, that could be, could be difficult to, to navigate, you know, and especially when it comes to, you know, errors or, or terms that you've, that you've given to early investors that, you know, an investor come, a VC coming in is going to say, that's got to go. And if you can't get a change, you can't get a deal done. You know, things like giving an early investor, you know, liquidation preference multiples or, you know, having, uh, you know, a, like I said before, you know, a, a whole slew of notes that are on all sorts of different terms. You have valuation caps all over the place. And now you got to come and sort that out. And the investors coming in and saying, well, you know, if we do this deal and all that stuff converts, you as a founder have 10 percent of the company left. Uh, and so we got to go back to the table and renegotiate that because I'm not going to invest in a company where the founder doesn't have more skin in the game. Yeah, <laughs> there's just a lot going on. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. Are there any surprises that you have seen kind of time and time again where the founder is just like, okay, that was unexpected? Yeah, I think that there's kind of two buckets on that. You know, one is um, surprises that are 
that are on the legal side, you know, things they've done that might come back to haunt them at the fundraising stage uh, that they really just weren't expecting. So, you know, a lot of times, for instance, you know, there are issues, people will, you, you get good advice that, look, you form an LLC when you're starting out and you can always convert it later to a, to a C Corp when it, if a VC wants you to. And that's true. Um, you know, the problem is how far down the road do you get with that LLC? And what all have you done? Have you put in place, you know, employee equity? Have you, have you run up a bunch of, you know, and this is kind of in the weeds, but, you know, accumulated losses as a, as a partner, because now you're in a partnership, you have multiple people in that LLC. And do you understand the tax consequences of partnership tax and, and accounting and how all that's going to work when you convert that entity? Because there are a lot of traps there for, for, you know, folks who aren't regularly talking to their, their tax advisors on that stuff. So, that's one thing where, you know, I've seen again and again where, you know, an LLC that's kind of carried on for a long time and raised money in that LLC and, and, and then you go to convert it and there's just like a host of tax traps and some of them just don't, can't fix, you know, and it's just, there's going to be consequences there. You know, the, I think the other, the other big uh, kind of main bucket of surprises is, or, or, or I should say, you know, also on that, if, you've, if you have raised a bunch of money in convertible instruments, notes and safes, and then you go to convert those things in an equity round and the investor is saying, well, you know, that that's all got to convert you know, in the pre-money. Uh, basically, I'm not taking as an investor, I'm not taking any dilution from the conversion of these notes and saves you may have done on whatever terms. And so that's all going to be a pre-money conversion. And and you also just haven't modeled out, you know, how all that stuff's going to convert. And you end up looking at that that cap table, you know, pro forma cap table, as they say in connection with a term sheet and you say, well, I am taking a hell of a lot more dilution than I thought I was going to be. You know, you factor in things like the option pools and all that stuff and, and you can end up with a lot less of the company than you, you were hoping at an early stage at a seed or an A round, you know? Um, and then the other thing I think is surprising to some folks is, is sometimes the terms and framework of, you know, venture capital terms. Um, you know, the, there's kind of a standard, a relatively standard approach overall, you know, high level. And, and if you're not already familiar, you will at some point with be familiar with, you know, National Venture Capital Association, NBCA, you know, type framework. And that's all built around really protecting minority investors in a company with kind of the, the background presumption that you as a, as a founder, uh, you know, are the principal owner and operator of the company. And so there's not a lot in there that says like you're affirmatively protected, protected in this way or that way. You know, you don't necessarily have approval rights over things and, and things like that. So under, understanding uh, that framework, I think sometimes people get, get a little bit surprised by, by that and want to and try to push for things that they, they totally reasonably feel like should be in there, but um, are really going to be non-starters. And so, you know, adjusting expectations, I think at that point, and just understanding what you're getting into uh, is important. Yeah, definitely. Good advice. Is there something that has been increasingly important over the last 10 years where it may not have mattered to founders or investors a decade ago, but now is like an absolute? Uh, I mean, one thing that's that, you know, this may change going forward, but, you know, and this is if you haven't heard already, you will. I'm sure at some point uh, it's it's now getting more attention kind of in the press and stuff because it's kind of it's potentially on the chopping block to a certain extent is qualified small business stock treatment. And so this is I mean, it, it kind of relates to the choice of entity thing as well, which is, you know, if you're, if you're in a C Corp um, and you're, you qualify as a small business, then the stock issued, you know, while you are still qualifying as a small business within, within the definition is, is potentially, you know, the way things are now anyway, uh, your, all your gain on that could be completely tax exempt. Um, uh, but that that is changing, uh, you know. Uh, there are there are other kind of surcharges and things that input. But but anyway, in any event, that that they may be reduced to fifty percent. That's been talked about. So that that may be de-emphasized a little bit going forward. But you know, I think if we compare now to ten years ago, I don't know. Ten years ago wasn't really on a lot of people's radars. They improved the the treatment of QSBS uh, during the Trump tax reform, and so it's it's that's something that's been a real focus. And, you know, in the last probably five, six years, there was, you know, model terms around, you know, making sure your QSBS, your stock is QSBS eligible and all these things. And, and it's also why investor, it's one of the reasons why investors now will say, look, we're not going to do the kinds of things we might've done 
to get around the fact that you're an LLC um, and we want you have to be a C Corp because that that USPS treatment is really important to us. Okay. I know you mentioned a lot of different terms. You mentioned NC National Venture Capital Association. Are there other resources people can like go to to learn more about these things or should they just hire a lawyer and call it good? I mean, I, I would say, you know, do both. Um, and, and not necessarily just even hire a lawyer, but, you know, having a conversation with somebody who, you, who you've, you've met through your network and, and, you know, know that they're experienced. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, the NVCA resources are great, um, but they're a little tech. They're, they're, not, they're not designed for, for lay people to have them be accessible. But they have a term sheet, model term sheet that's annotated, that has information on kind of market terms, and it's very useful resource um, if you can navigate that and spend a little time on Google kind of googling what some of these the, the lingo means and all that kind of stuff but um, you know that's great and then also there's I mean there are so many blogs out there by VCS you know by you know hot you know real high profile VCS and all that that, that really break down a lot of the the aspects of, of capital raising and the in the nitty-gritty of terms and and kind of a cap table algebra uh, type of thing so you, you can understand and, and try to model on your own and, and project out, you know, what what you're going to own of your company if you raise money in certain valuations or terms and that kind of thing. So, I mean, there's, I mean, the internet's your friend uh, in, in most cases, uh, but uh, <laughs> um, in, in this case in particular, I think the internet is your friend, and and there's a lot there's a lot out there. I mean, when I started doing this stuff about you know 10, 10 years ago or so. That was even then. I, was, I spent a lot of my time just educating myself on, on this stuff by just reading everything you could find, you know. And you know, obviously, you know, Brad Feld's post, you know, a gazillion books, and and you know, the Venture Deals book is still kind of a, a great kind of entry level resource to understanding, you know, the the ins and outs of of the legal side of venture deals. Okay, great. Well, very informative. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Nick and Lauren. Setting up a company can be an arduous process and super important that you uh, you set it up properly from the beginning. It can, uh, if you don't do it correctly, there's, it's, you're going to pay for it later, basically. And, um, you know, it's not the end of the world, but you'll, you can always fix it, but it, it becomes harder along the way. So uh, if you want to learn more about Nick and his firm, check out, check out the, uh, the show notes. We're going to be dropping a link in there. And uh, if you want to learn more about Lauren Coffey, she's actually a regular contributor to uh, Tampa Bay Inno as well as Tampa Bay Business Journal. So you can see her work out online um, and she covered uh, the summit as well. So we've got some some coverage from her uh, from our summit. I also wanted to mention, though, uh, if you wanted to see more of the summit, if you hadn't didn't have a chance to, to attend in person or didn't get a chance to watch it yet online, you can simply go to SOTY.link forward slash EST or EST YouTube. Again, it's SOTY.link forward slash EST YouTube. And that'll go to the live stream of the event. And you can actually watch the two days that we stream live uh, right at, right now on our, on our page. You can fast forward and rewind and watch it over and over. A lot of great uh, information and nuggets there if you're a startup founder um, or investor or, or thought leader. So check it out and I hope you enjoy it. All right. For all of those listeners out there, hopefully you enjoyed this conversation. Uh, if you found it interesting, please do share it. Uh, sharing is caring. We believe in that. And uh, please pass it on. We, we want to help everyone we can with, with the various lessons learned here in our podcast and in our live events as well. All right. Well, that's the episode. Remember, if you have a startup idea and you want to get it going, today is the best day to start up. Not tomorrow, not the next day. Get it going. Get it started. Iterate. And in doing so, I encourage you to join our community uh, for access to support, expert advice, and resources everything you need to elevate your startup by simply going to startupofyear.com or going directly to our application to join. Go to SOTY.link forward slash apply. It's free to join. We've got a lot of different programs happening and we'd love to have you. So please do that. Until next time, I'm Frank Gruber and uh, thanks for listening and we'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to the Startup of the Year podcast. Be sure to subscribe and we'll be back with another episode soon.